Welcome to episode 193 of the Disorganized Wizards Club podcast. My name is Alex, I'm joined as always by Adam. Hello. And Cam. Hello, hello. And we're a group of Ottawa-based players that play just about anything and everything we can qualify for. We talk about decks, tournament stories, just about anything to help you and ourselves get better at magic. That's the plan. Coming to you from this gorgeous summer evening in the nation's capital. Great number. 93 was a great year. Wait, were you born in 93? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, so, so was there I. You go, there you go. Oh, there you <laughs> go. Look year. at that. Both of you. <laughs> yeah. Got them all. It's a great year because uh, unless you, well, you might not actually know this, um, but three rhymes with free. So a friend of mine and some other friends of mine, when they lived in residence in the first year of their whatever, they would put up signs on their door and the topic changed based like week to week or things that happened, but they were all blank free since 93. <laughs> yeah, no. 93 till infinity. Yeah, I sold them. But different things that, you know, hadn't happened to them yet in the blanks. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but then, like, they'd, they'd go out for parties or something one night and something would go wrong and one person would have to take their sign down. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, we've got a lot to talk about this week. A very eventful past week in Magic. Uh, the DWC organizational was this past weekend. We had over 50 players come out to battle some historic. Whole thing was taken down by Dancy Pants playing Mono Red Goblins. We've uploaded coverage from our top eight to our YouTube channel. So if you want to check out that, if you missed it, head on over to YouTube, search the Organized Wizards Club. It's all up there. And the event, the entire event stream is still up on our uh, Twitch page. So if you want to watch the whole thing, you can check it out there as well in the VODs. Uh, yeah, we covered the entire event, six rounds of Swiss plus all three rounds of top eight. And uh, it went really well. We had a good showing. Uh, for viewers, I think coverage looked great. Uh, gameplay was good. Event was fun. How you guys feeling after that? I loved it. I had a wonderful time casting it. I thought the historic meta looked really fun. Despite the fact that the top eight we had had um, quite a few different sacrifice decks in it, I still thought the gameplay itself was really enjoyable. It was a blast of a tournament to cast. And uh, yeah, it you know, the format's wild, constantly getting new cards, but the tournament itself was great. Also, how smoothly did it run? We were done in six hours, I think, and we played nine rounds or something. Yeah, yeah it, it, it went by really fast. That's true. We didn't have any hiccups in the early rounds. Uh, it was, yeah, great. Not to toot our own horn or anything, but man, those TOs were fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good tournament. I got to say, Steli, the new slides and everything you made for the... <clears throat> the production side looked amazing. So yeah, big shout yeah, out to you for that. Got some uh, good, amazing. good feedback from people who are watching on that, I, which is good because I've, I put a lot of hours into making sure it all looked nice. So happy it all worked out. Looking forward to doing another one. It was uh, definitely a lot of fun. But yeah, you were right. Uh, the sacrifice decks came out in droves and they they dominated the tournament. Three Jun Sack, two Red Black Sack decks pushing into the top eight. And we we kind of talked about our the decks we thought were kind of top tier and historic on last week's podcast. And I, I remember mentioning I thought that the blue white auras deck was pretty good, and also that the sacrifice decks were good. And if we expected to see a lot of the auras decks, the uh, sacrifice decks would be pretty well positioned. And uh, yeah, we kind of just saw exactly that. The auras decks didn't really have a great showing, and the sacrifice decks dominated the field, which isn't really surprising because it's a proven engine that works. Uh, one of the cards got banned from standard. You know, the, these strategies are very good and you're just more consistent and punching out a more po a powerful endgame in Bolas' Citadel. So, Bolas' Citadel was an unbelievable bomb. Watching it, How insane was it watching it in Historic over the course of the tournament? Yeah, there were some pretty good Citadel turns, <laughs> that's for sure. No, that's, that's pretty a, good. It was rare yeah. that it didn't just immediately kill yeah, the opponent. That's, yeah. that's a pretty nice way of phrasing it. Pretty good. It just ended the game every time. Yeah. <laughs> Some pretty good Moxus turns also. You know, they were okay. <laughs> yeah, if anyone wants to see some of the, the best Moxus turns, head to the YouTube and check out that semifinal matchup. I also posted um, a clip onto our Twitter page at DWC Podcast One. It's actually our pinned tweet right now, which is a, a pretty good one. So check that out if you want to see a sweet Muxus. Yeah, but these like huge swingy turns aside, I think it's actually fine. Like I feel pretty good about the format and where it's going. Like obviously it just got bun a bunch of new cards and there's room to adjust and such. And the format was just shaken up. So it kind of makes sense that these known 
entities would do well. But like, I don't think we saw a single graph diggers cage, and it stops cat oven, and it stops bolus the citadel, and it stops Muxus. Yeah, yeah. graph diggers cage would have been an uh, an all star sideboard card. But yeah, we didn't really see it. You're right. No, we so, we watched a lot of sacrifice on coverage as it was the deck that was uh, performing well through the event, and yeah, not not many decks brought Graft Digger's Cage to the event from what we saw. And it makes sense that like if Graft Digger's Cage would shut off every deck that we watched, that obviously they wouldn't be playing it because it would shut off their own strategy. But it means that there's room for other things to um, to play it if they want to attack these strategies. It yeah, probably yeah. fits with Golos pretty well. Uh, what does Golos have to do, use its graveyard or library for? Nothing really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, does he already compose things like Jukabog? And now with the additions of the desert, you actually can play um you can you can play Bajukabog's probably better, but if you want, Hour of Promise also gives you access to the um the desert, the sack desert. What's it called again? Scavenger oh, Grounds. Sca- uh, scavenger scavenger grounds. grounds. Yeah. So the cause Hour of Promise is uh probably gotta be just unbelievable and historic, so yeah. Um, you get access to a lot of that to interfere with the graveyard if you want, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that. But to round out the top eight, from first to eighth, after everything was all said and done, we had Dancy Pants taking down the event with Mono Red Goblins. Uh, Rakdos Sacrifice in second and third place. Fourth place was our one Golo stack in the top eight. Fifth through seventh were all Jun Sacrifice. And then rounding out our top eight in eighth place was a pretty sweet Teamer Niv Mizzet deck which fe- featured the uh, historic Splinter Twin of Niv-Mizzet plus Curiosity, which <laughs> we did get to see for one. the record. Yeah, we, uh, we did get to see happen once on stream, which was pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Back that deck wins my uh, sweetest deck at the tournament award. Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely a cool one. Uh, I think the first time we saw it on camera, the player literally had all four of his Niv-Mizzets killed. Uh, and yeah. the, the third one got equipped with a curiosity, but there was no mana to uh, to uh, cast another spell to win immediately. So it ended up just dying. Regardless, there were some yeah. ones. There were some insane turns the whole tournament. Yeah. Also, because we had the backup matches recorded, but we could also cast. It was nonstop action around there. We yeah. had no downtime. Yeah, I know. I I spent all this time putting together like slides and stuff for breaks. So we could have ads rolling and all that stuff, and we barely used it because we just always had magic to watch, <laughs> which was great. <laughs> yeah, we got time shifted tech. We got everything. Mm-hmm. Downtime free since '93. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so that was that this past weekend. The whole event was sponsored by WizardTower.com, which are also the number one sponsor of this podcast. Check them out for all your magic single needs. Double Masters is up. Got a bunch of stock. So if you want to get your hands on that, head on over to wizardtower.com. And a big thank you to them for supporting us and the sponsoring the organizational once again. It was awesome. Amonkhet Remastered came out today. We we're recording Thursday night. So it's day one. Historic got a huge shakeup. Uh, I've been brewing I a can't bunch of uh, thoughts in the format. Yeah, it's kind of weird. They they just kind of added. A bunch of extra cards in. We've got Thoughtseize, Collected Company, Rest in Peace, in Peace, Wrath of God, a bunch of uh, Anger of the Gods. Yeah, just a bunch of cards that weren't actually in the set, but were added straight into Historic and pretty powerful cards, <laughs> all things considered. Like that's just a murderer's row. Insane. Oh yeah, it's bananas. <laughs> well, like man, you could jund. Sacrifice can collect a company into its Mayhem Devils and Woe Striders. What a world. Yeah, that's actually wild. Yeah, so huge shakeup. I spent a lot of my time today when I was getting tattooed, just like brewing up God Pharaoh's gift decks. Look. Oh, yeah, because the GPG. G, yeah, we were talking about that before. All mm-hmm. the potential GPG decks seem unbelievable. Man, Historic got a massive power boost. They're playing with fire. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens, but. Uh, I do think one of the cards that the format was missing that could have led to things getting a little out of hand was Thoughtseize. So we did get Thoughtseize. But I think the big problem we might be facing soon is how big of an issue will Field of the Dead Hour of Promise be. Because uh, that uh, that little combination did get Field of the Dead banned from Pioneer. So 
Yeah, and that's Pioneer. Like, I actually think they're going to regret this one. Yeah, we'll see. I'm not really too sh- sure yet. It's still day one, but it, uh, it is a pretty powerful combination. <laughs> it, is a, it is a combination <laughs> of cards, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be okay, but yeah, our adds a whole different level. Like, there might be an argument that that they don't even need to play something like Ugin anymore. Um, just because our and Golos at five puts them at such velocity that they can start playing other options for removal and stuff as well. They could play more controlling versions. Like, it just opens up a lot of space for them that I think they wouldn't normally have just because our warps things so much. It's so consistent. Yeah. Even that said, though, Hour does ramp you right into the Ugin, so <laughs> might still be something they want, but... Yeah. Yeah, they probably still do, but you can start probably considering playing Ulamog a lot more, too, as well. Mm-hmm. Because the amount of ramp you have access to in the field, field decks now, you know, like you have Explore, Grow Spiral. If you want, you can put like Uro and Rejuvenator. Um, and then you... I mean, there's still others. There's our goal. Of, yeah, it's just so much. It's so many powerful options for yeah. ramp that I don't even know. You could probably just get to Lamog. I'm I'm also curious how good the mono red deck's gonna be because we just got like an all star one drop in Soul Scar Mage added. Hazaret's back in the format. Earthshaker Kenra was played nonstop in mono red decks. We got Ramunap Ruins as well. Like there's oh, a lot of huge about that. in the format. Yeah, a lot of huge <laughs> pickups for the red deck. So we'll see how that does. I mean, there there was already kind of a Wizards Burn deck that was seeing a decent amount of play on ladder, and Soul Scar Mage is like the perfect one drop that that deck needed. Yeah, it's the dream for them. It unlocks so many cards for them to play and brew with. Yeah, there was someone in our Discord who was really into that burn list. They were playing, I think, Chandra's Incinerator and like brew brewing burn lists in Historic, and they were hype for Ammon Kit to come out. And so I'm sure the Incinerators are out. And Soul Scar and Hazard are in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Hazard's just got to be massive in the format. I mean, there's that card is really difficult. What in, what in Historic can really interact with it well? I'm trying to think. Field of the Dead. I don't <laughs> think it ever had to fight that card. That card, Hazard's not getting past zombies. That's true. We do have, uh, you. It, it's literally just like the full powered mono red from the format where Ruins and Ferocidon got banned. You're just allowed to play everything. Plus, you have like Annex and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're just going to be overwhelmed with powerful threats. But it's just yeah. going to be whether that strategy even lines up, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. That's actually a really interesting like experiment to see play out. Like, do the cards that got mono red banned fight well against the more recent blue green cards that made mono red unplayable? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Who wins? I don't know. Yeah, who like comes up on top? Yeah, if your Urshaker counter like has haste and attacks for two, but their yeah. Uro gained three, and then it's a six six. Like, what? how scary was that mono red deck? <laughs> yeah, Ru- ramming up ruins just gave it so much reach, and it's. I mean, it's obviously going to give you that again. And I feel like there's you're going to win a lot of games where like the field decks will stabilize behind a, a whole wall of zombies, and then you'll just chuck them out over two turns with your ruins. Which yeah, is like kind probably, of what yeah. we saw happen last time in standard. Yeah, I don't know. Mono red. It's definitely one of uh, my top contenders to try once I get to dive into the format. I'm right going to be honest the, with you. I'm what? only gonna. I'm only gonna play field decks. I'm well. Okay, I'm only gonna play our promise and or field decks. Uh, I'm I'm gonna be real with you. I'm so excited. Field's one of my favorite cards. When it was spoiled, I was like losing it. Remember? Yep. And yeah, just, I love Golos. I love our. This is just um. I'm I'm just happy out here, you know. You know what I'm probably gonna do? All right. So Field of the Dead makes a lot of zombies, right? It does indeed. It makes several to dozens. Several, several to dozens. Um, <laughs> sometimes more. And the Scarab God just domes your opponent if you have zombies. <gasps> oh yeah, because GPG gets Scarab God Steli. Yeah, it does. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> like. Yeah, you just play Scarab God. You don't have to attack with your zombies. They just lose X life. You scry X. <laughs> yeah, not bad, actually. Maybe it's like a bit slow and like just the zombies themselves are enough and it's win more, but Scarab God is a sweet card. I remember thinking it was too strong. Now I see it was fine, but I'm excited to play with it again. Yeah, it's pretty fair. 
I mean, four mana, four fours. People are complaining about that card, but I mean, come on. It might be too slow for this format, to be That's honest. What I mean. Yeah, it might yeah. be. Like that card sees zero play at Pioneer. And Historic is like, might have a po- higher power level than Pioneer now. I, that's what I'm kind of getting at. Like, I, I think the power level on Historic might be like way higher than they thought. That's crazy to think, but I guess if you just make everything legal eventually. Yeah, like especially now that they banned all the combo decks from Pioneer. Yeah, that's what I mean. And Pioneer, we were kind of joking about this, right? About Pioneer being a, like having a hard time because it seems like a paper format by comparison right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Historic, the power level on Historic is just just uh, actually unbelievable right now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like Thoughtseize, yeah. Hour, all these crazy lands. Like, you can do anything. It's mostly all propped up by Field of the Dead, though. If we lose Field of the Dead in Historic, I think the power flips to Pioneer again, but... Yeah, fair. Yeah. Field of the Dead, man. It's a good card. Yeah, confirmed. It's it's pretty good. <laughs> can you believe what they suspended they it, then unsuspended it? They're like, you know what? It's actually fine. We'll let them play with like it. like it, because... It- you know, I love well, playing the card, but yeah, it's probably a little too broken. Yeah. yeah. What were they thinking when they designed it? Like seven different card like lands? Well, like, there's no like, way. I mean, no one really pegged it, right? It. Like we overlooked it too. Uh, I was pretty adamant about it, but yeah. Did they like no, I didn't think it was gonna be the level it was, not even close. Like I didn't think it was gonna be nearly as good. It, it to be honest, it did seem like seven lands, you know, was a big deal just feels like they looked at the decks that had been popular over the previous two years while designing it, and they're like, these decks all have six or less different lands in them. Let's make it seven. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, go but... on. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Four shocks, four checks, and two different types of basics. This deck can only make four lands in play. It's fine. <laughs> Seems fine to me. Crazy to see what's going to happen. Yeah, I'm, I I'm think excited. Red decks won't actually be that good because there's too many like hateful cards for them. But that's just me. I don't know. Like I, I just think the power level so high on historic that even though mono red gets all those cards too, it might also still have a problem. But I could be wrong. You could be right. I mean, the sacrifice decks aren't going anywhere, and they probably just got a little bit of a buff too. And those, the sacrifice decks have historically preyed on the red aggro decks, so. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, but it'll be curious where it goes. It's just, it feels like it's easy for Mono Red right now to, f- um, I guess, to fall behind. Is that, yeah, I guess, where like it feels like, you know, like Field of the Dead can just get too many zombies in front of Mono Red before they can chip in. But if they're playing more burn focused, I think it's probably safer for them going forward because the burn strategy seems a little better than just the creatures, just because of all the things they can get in the way. But yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, look, it's literally day one, you know? Yeah, like if I was going to play Mono Red, I th- I'd be playing like four, four Soul Scar Mage, four of the uh, the Dominaria Wizard, the one, two, what's his name? Lava Runner, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. four Grim Lava Mancer, and then just like Bolt, Bolt, Shock, Lightning Strike, Hazaret. That's my deck, Mountains. Like that's probably really good. Yeah, for sure. That sounds exactly what you want. Throw a light up in the stage in there too. That card's probably good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. No, no shortage. That's what's interesting though. There's no shortage really. It seems for mono red for options going forward. Man, approach of the second sun is back. Are there any new ways to abuse this mechanic? I don't know. Uh, I wonder. I mean, the card's pretty good. It just wins the game sometimes. There's a uh, to abuse it. No, there's like. Does it pair well with Narset's reversal? Does that work how I think it does? Uh, I think the first one has to resolve. Does it? I don't think it does. I'm pretty sure approach just reads if it's the second time you've cast this card. This if it game. was, if it was cast from your hand and you've cast another spell named approach, then you win. Okay. So copies don't do it. Okay, so that doesn't work. Imagine how I want it. <laughs> you just get them. But like, it wasn't alongside Narset. Like Narset three just finds this thing again. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. Mm. Yeah, I saw a pretty gross-looking blue-white control deck today that had Pact of Negation, Three Mana Gideon, Approach, Narset, Mind Stone. It, Wait, uh, that actually sounds amazing. It made me feel a little gross inside, but uh, 
Yeah, pack notification is in the format too. That was one I forgot to mention earlier. Crazy. Yeah, that's, that's a big crazy addition. Yeah, yeah, actually. That card counters anything for free. It's insanity. Someone told me they died to a Solemnity combo earlier today. Because <laughs> if you have Solemnity and Luminous Broodmoth, your creatures don't get the flying counters. Yeah. And oh, then yeah. they just uh, sacked a Fanatical Firebrand over and over. <laughs> yeah. You can also do that with uh, Croxa too for like infinite three damage. Oh, yeah. Oh, There's ways cool. to do it. I've been like, I was thinking about that when uh, Luminous Broodmoth got uh, spoiled. I saw some people talking about Solemnity Combo, and I threw together some pretty bad-looking deck lists for Pioneer, but <laughs> nothing ever actually came to fruition, but hmm. was a, was fun to, to brew them up, for sure. Yeah, let's do these spoilers and see what other cards I've forgotten about. Pull from tomorrow? Crazy. Oh, Sphinx's Revelation? Yeah, I saw that. I was obviously hype. Wait, they printed actual Sphinx's Rev? Yep. Yep. Huh. Pretty sweet, eh? Uh, yeah, I never played with that card. Oh, it's an enjoyable experience. Dude, I can't believe they just put Wrath of God in this set. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Like, what? Yeah, I, like, is there anything that the regeneration matters for? I'm trying to think. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily think there's anything that it matters for off the top of my head. It's just weird that, you know, they kind of moved away from the four mana Wraths for a while. And then yeah. they gave us like a pretty mediocre version of it recently in uh, Theros. Yeah. And then they're like, you know what? Let's just give them one of the best versions. Here you go. Right into Historic. It's fine. Yeah, never mind. You guys can just have it. <laughs> yeah. We got thoughts. Yeah, Historic's going to be a wild time. If you're brewing and you're at home in quarantine, you're playing a lot of Arena, let me tell you right now, not a bad time. Yeah. Like, you can do a lot in Historic. It's an open format. It seems cool. The gameplay, I don't know, from casting it on the weekend, I thought the format... I'm like a pretty heavy advocate of the format right now. Um, but also, do we have anything else we want to talk about from Historic or do we want to talk about a little bit of our other experiences? We can move on. Something I like think standard. we've touched on our thoughts a decent amount so far. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we played, uh, we played Standard this week at DWC Versus. Moved away from Historic since it was getting a shakeup this week. Uh, I brought Saltai Midrange and Rakdos Sack. Uh, Cam, you brought Abzan Yorian and a Teamer Midrange deck. And Adam, uh, what did you bring, Adam? I brought the two Winoda deck. The, decks. the two Winoda decks, yeah, that's right. Mardu Winoda and Jeskai Winoda. And uh, I, I had fun playing Standard again. It was nice to be back, not have to worry about Teferi, Grow Spiral. Yeah, just so many things have opened up now that Teferi's gone, like... It's just so nice. Like Niv Mizzet's yeah. back. That teamer mid range deck I was playing had instant speed interaction and six mana Niv. Where before that card would just like get bounce and not do anything. The fact like cards that you have to pay a bit more for because they can't be countered matter now because opponents might have counter spells. <laughs> yeah, they can actually they're allowed you're allowed to play them. Yeah. Okay, another takeaway, oh, holy, and before we forget this, perhaps the number one takeaway from our standard experience last night was, uh, for me at least, was Narset, still obnoxious. Still hitting people with the cattle oh, yeah. prod. Zzz, just trying to draw cards. <laughs> yeah, Narset uh, looked pretty good in the games uh, I drew her, that's for sure. Yeah. Completely, like, locked Cam out in that one matchup. Yeah, it's just that angry mom. You're like, Narset, can I have some more cards? And she's like, no, well, you have cards at home. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was surprising uh, to see how sort of how how much it absolutely shut down the deck you were playing, Cam, the teamer deck you were playing. Like you didn't even get to play, it felt like. Uh, it was a Jorel deck. So sure. yeah, a true. lot of the cards were built on like being able to cycle. And I had maybe sideboarded a bit incorrectly and left myself with not enough outs to a Narset. But yeah, like it just hard counters Joel Rail strategies. I mean, obviously, you're playing a bunch of cards that trigger something that needs you to draw a second card per turn, and Narset forbids exactly that. So it feels miserable casting Uro into it because you're just kind of discarding Uro to put a land into play, which isn't worth it. Um, draw spells couldn't do anything, it ranches to Fairy 4. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, you just can't really use it on your turn. You can plus once on their turn. But, like, yeah, it was it was hard to do anything about. And the fact that the whole time Narset's, like, generating gas and resources for your opponent. So even if I did have something like a Niv-Mizzet, 
they're going to find an answer for it or it shuts off the draws from Niv. Yeah, it was it was not a good... Definitely need more mystical disputes for that card. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the Saltai deck I played felt pretty good. It also... Uh, Saltai took down the SCG Championship Qualifier this past weekend as well. So we talk, I talked a little bit about the deck last week and said that I thought it was probably one of the better decks in the format now with all the new changes. And... Uh, Surprise, surprise, takes down the biggest standard event this past weekend. So just wanted to say I called it. Salt is the best, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, deck is really good right now. Um, lines up really well. Just has lots of big, powerful, swingy mid-range options. Yeah, it seems Honestly, really strong like, watching you play. It just looked like picking people apart. Yeah, you have to have a, I think you have to have a pretty good reason to not be playing Nissa, Hydro, Crace, Uro. So, and then Saltai is just the best Nissa Hydroid Crace, Hydroid Crace's Uro deck at the moment. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, people act like they forgot about Nissa and then she comes back. You, you play her on turn four, you know, mm -hmm. people have no board and they just lose on the spot. Like, each of those cards are so incredibly impactful by themselves. Like, a Crace is refueling or a Nissa can just win the game by itself. That, like, your threat density leaves room for Saltai to play things like Thought Erasure and Narset and all these other sort of prison-esque answers which gives it the flexibility like it just felt like the most flexible option of all the decks that we brought and of really something i could imagine in standard yeah if you're uh if you're picking up uh salt eye for this past weekend uh if you see a deck that isn't playing for nissa for hydroid crisis just throw that deck in the garbage and and find a new one because <laughs> holy fuck so many people have sent me salt eye decks and been like what do you think and <laughs> The first thing I check, for Nissa, for Uro, for, Uro, for uh, Hydroid Crisis. You got that, you're good. Everything else doesn't matter. <laughs> like, yeah, honestly, like, like I, don't, I don't understand why people aren't playing for Hydroid Crisis for Nissa right now. They're literally like the two of the best cards in your deck. Like, I understand why people cut down on them beforehand, but like, I under, and I also understand why like a deck like Bant Midrange wasn't playing. Um, four of each because they just act weren't really that good in that strategy but like this is a new format i mean saltai is a completely new deck without growth spiral like you just have to play four of both those cards that's my rant. yeah i agree everyone who's listening play four don't be dumb <laughs> i agree i think anything else for standard i'm trying to think i think that like we're kind of just back in a normal like you know, mid-range, sort of you're in, but you probably play control. Like, I think the power level's just been dropped. Like, I don't think there's for sure, like, an obvious, like, only deck you can play. I just think that the power level's been dropped. In which case, you do see Saltai play a lot of powerful, really big, late standard cards, right? Like, big set standard cards that are really powerful, of course. But it seems fine to me, right? Like, I don't think that's a problem. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think the format's totally fine right now. I'm just trying to pull up the uh, the SCG top eight. Can take a look. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's probably okay. I mean, the, it feels like you can sort of maybe start playing aggro decks again. I wonder what other options there are. But one of the things that's a problem is, yeah, the Saltai deck having things like Eliminate gives them so many options to slow down early decks. But Yeah, mm -hmm. standard it seems like it's safe. I'm still really looking forward to rotation. I am I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to things like Uro and one out leaving, you know? Well, yeah, Uro's not going sorry, anywhere, no, friend. Set. I'm in Narset. I'm, I'm in Narset, still... yeah, sorry. Not going to get invested in this summer fling of a small format. I'm going to wait for new standard proper. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. You still looking for those tournaments, Stully? Yeah, I just uh, I just found it. Here we are. Okay, okay so the SCG top eight from this past weekend. Saltai took down first place. Second place, Rakdos Sack. Third place, Saltai. Fourth place, Rakdos Sack. Fifth place, Mardu Winota. Sixth place, Teamer Adventures. Seventh and eighth, both Saltai. Huh. Let's look at the top 16. Ninth place, Saltai. Tenth place, Saltai. Thirteenth place, <laughs> Saltai. That's no small amount. Hmm. I wonder, I wonder which deck is performing well right now in standard. Let me think. I'm actually yeah, I'm surprised good. to see Rakdosak so high up after losing Cat. Yeah, I mean, it did lose a powerful engine. I will say that that is a big beating, and that is one of the big problems. Although the list you played last night with some of the reworks, playing more village rights, playing different options, it did look pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the second Still, place list from the SCG is actually a Luris deck. It's not even playing uh, Mayhem Devil. Oh, crazy. Hmm. Archfiend's Vessel, Meyer Triton, uh, Fiend Artisans, 
call it a death dweller. Oh, that's kind of cool. Nice. Yeah. Hmm. I, I mean, I guess the deck still has legs. Um, and I, I guess this build makes a lot of sense. If you can't play cat, you're not playing oven, and why, why play mayhem devil at that point? I guess when you could just uh, be a little cheaper, play Luris in your sideboard, call, and just focus more on your uh, Croxa priest fiend artisan engine. Seems decent. Yeah, I don't oh, mind. That. That. Yeah, I mean That's the priest like, oh, engine looked unbelievable. Uh, I mean, sorry, is unbelievable. It didn't look. I mean, I just was thinking about it last night in a different setting where I'm just getting smashed over and over by priests. But yeah, I mean, priest is still a scary card. It still has a lot of really powerful options for it. So you know, losing Cadavan is a beating. The deck's not as powerful, but it's still really strong. It felt like I don't know, might get edged out. Speaking of priest, I think that card's a pretty good segue because that's a card that definitely makes your opponent react to it. <laughs> You got to kill that thing, like, immediately. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you just get ranched. If they untap with a priest, they're going to steal one of your creatures, play another creature, and just pop off. That's a real interesting segue, Cam. What are we talking about today? So this was a topic that was requested a while ago by one of our listeners. They requested an episode kind of generally on different ways that you can play to force your opponent to make certain decisions that might be bad for them. And so... We thought about it a bit during the pre-show if you want to go hear our brainstorming session. Um, but really, like, uh, the way that we're summarizing making your opponent make certain decisions is how to play to force your opponent to play reactively. Now, before we explain how to do this, we should probably sell you on why you would want to do this. In the past, we've had episodes about how you yourself can play more proactively. And in those episodes, we discussed that when you have a proactive plan and you're more um, sort of on the front foot, you have more control over the game plan, your fail states are a bit better, whereas if you're only ever reacting to your, to your opponent, all it takes is one of their threats to slip through that you can't react to, um, and then that'll kill you. Or um, if you never develop your own game plan because all you're doing is trying to react, then it gives your opponent a bunch of free time. So we advised against playing reactively, and so if you can force your opponent into a reactive role, it means that you're stopping them from developing their primary game plan. You're forcing them to maybe use awkward amounts of mana on certain turns uh, in order to answer what you're doing. And generally, it just means that you're developing your game plan, even though they're interacting with it. You're developing your game plan before they are, and so you're sort of ahead in the speed of the game. And as I mentioned our, with our segue example, so many decks want to be, like, John Food decks want to be playing out things like um, trail of crumbs or cats or ovens or devils but if there's an opposing priest they won't they'll just use their whole turn to stomp the priest and it's kind of a nothing turn but they have to yeah that makes a lot of sense would you say that uh, a specific example something like playing mirror matches um, being proactive and making your opponent play more reactively is generally a winning uh, recipe to take down those specific mirror matches yeah I mean I think it's just a recipe in general like whoever is more proactive is going to be on the front foot like that's why we were so high i think scavenging ooze was our prime example for graveyard hate because it's graveyard hate they can also do something if your opponent doesn't use their graveyard that game or once you have removed their graveyard it's still a threat unlike something like you know maybe three mana ashiok or grafter's cage where if your opponent's draw doesn't utilize its graveyard that card just does nothing and you're mm -hmm. you've mulliganed so yeah, just in general, like being proactive is better. Yeah, I guess. Right. I guess. So, I guess the if, point I'm trying to make is like not specifically like actual mirrors as like Saltai versus Saltai or Rakdos versus Rakdos, but like aggro mirrors or like mid range mirrors. Because like, there's going to be certain matchups. Like if you're playing against control, obviously they're going to be playing reactively. That's because that's how their deck is built. But like, I think it's um, important to point out that like if you're playing mid range mirrors or playing um, aggro mirrors, just in general that uh, usually forcing your opponent to play reactively like this is how you can profitably attack these matchups. Yeah, because right, getting, getting ahead on the front foot means that, you know, their threats aren't as effective. Like, there's a million reasons, yeah, but usually it's because they also probably aren't playing the same reactive mix of spells. Um, that's why we kind of left control decks out of that. Like, I like that you left that out. You said the aggro and mid-range mirrors because in those spaces... They don't have a reactive suite of cards that can sort of dig them out of those positions. So you want to try and do the same. Right, similar in draft and limited, we do the same things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm actually going to slightly disagree with you guys and say that like, even against control, 
and in, well, control mirrors are sort of their own beast, but even like regular decks against control, yes, they have a lot of reactive options, but one of the first things that you kind of learn when you're playing control decks is how to react as little as possible. Wrath at the last moment, only counter things that have to be countered, only kill things eventually when you have spare mana, and instead focus on, you know, drawing cards, developing maybe a Planeswalker if it's not going to die. Like, generally, control decks try and react as little as they can. So even there, it's often a winning strategy. We have an example of this, but even there, it's often a winning strategy to force control decks to react sooner than they'd like. Yeah, sure. I I guess I wasn't, I wasn't saying that. My point wasn't really that, like, it's not a winning strategy versus control. It's just um, kind of obvious because that's just how their decks approach the game oh. is that they're always playing reactively. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, yeah that, that's kind of what I was trying to say. But yeah, I, I get what you mean. But I think you want to play it differently. You bait things in a little more in those other matches potentially. Whereas, yeah, I, I just sort of agree with a general flat plan in those sort of decks. But yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess like to elaborate or maybe to come up with an example, like in Aggro Mirrors. I think there was a time I was playing mono red and standard, and in the mono red mirrors, if you had like a fast start with one drops, and your opponent felt they had to use removal spell on your like removal spells on your creatures, it meant they weren't casting their creatures, so you still had your removal spells in hand, and because it's red, they're all burn spells, and so the few damage you didn't chip in put your opponent you know somewhat low, and by the time they developed a board presence, you could just ignore it and burn them out, and so that's generally sort of what happens as soon as one person starts trying to point removal spells or block, they just sort of lose a bunch of their resources that they need to finish the game. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a good example, for sure. Yeah, and there are certain cards even in standard that just sort of like automatically shift the change in focus of the game. In fact, one of the decks that I didn't even think about when we were sketching out the idea for this episode that's sort of based entirely around um, preventing people from playing either proactively or reactively and just determining and trying to base their entire win or loss on that is actually kind of doom foretold in some ways, right? Because they want to put the Doom Foretold down and then force you to just play reactive and wait. Yeah. yeah, that's their game plan. It's to just put you in that position where you're, you know, you're in the abyss, so to speak, quote unquote. Yeah, Doom Foretold, when it's doing its thing, prohibits the opponent from playing uh, their game plan. Like it's often the only way to really deal with the Doom Foretold is to just let it eat your permanence, not play out anything during that time, so that the Doom Foretold goes away, and then start playing out your game plan. Right, and so one of the worst matchups for Doom Foretold are like the control decks that don't care and they'll just wait and then they can draw cards and then just counter your impactful cards and don't care, mm-hmm. right? Um, they're better at just making you play reactive as Doom Foretold and just waiting and then you can't really do anything. But against the kind of decks where you're on the play, you get to go remove a spell, remove a spell, slam a Doom Foretold, you know, like you just win, right? So yeah, you see that happen. But there's a ton of other examples that we thought about. About what you know, you should think about your play as trying to maneuver it into putting other people into this reactive spot, so that their game plan, the cards in their hand, and all their sequencing doesn't line up the same way. That's kind of what we're talking about, right? Yeah. In general, I guess we and we have. Some, I'll have some examples of this that uh, we'll talk about. But the general sort of idea is understanding your opponent's goals in the current turn or matchup or match, and doing something that forces them to make a secondary option, something that they don't want to immediately do that turn. And so this leads well into our first example. We talked about this in the past, but there used to be in the old standard um, team or energy decks, and there were some sort of controlling versions playing Torrential Gearhulk, and there were Glimmer of Genius decks with a bunch of counter spells. And we often said, you just have to play your most threatening card into their four mana. Whether it's your Gideon or your um, Bristling Hydra was a big one at the time because it's hard for them to kill once it resolves. Like your must counter threats, you play them into their four mana because that's the turn where that deck, the Teamer Control deck, most wants to cast Glimmer of Genius. If they get to Glimmer on four, it bridges them into their next land drops. It gives them some extra energy to work with. It lets them plan out the rest of their game because they've seen what cards they've drawn. It just makes things so much easier. It gives them something in the graveyard to eventually flash back if they want to gear hulk. It just makes things so easy. So if you instead disallow them from freely casting a glimmer that turn by casting something threatening that they have to counter, making them react to your play, then they'll use three of their four mana on a cancel and that's their turn. They don't, they still have to find a window later in the game to glimmer 
And if they land on another turn, they're wasting a fifth mana. Like, it just makes things so awkward for them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's kind of what you're trying to do is match your threats so that they just never have that time, right? That window of time. And when they, you know, they, they can never really do it in a, in a space where it's relevant, right? And they have to take an entire turn off to cast it, and then you probably get to resolve things. That's kind of what you're getting at, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's a general sort of philosophy in how magic is designed that generic answers cost more than the things they answer. Um, I mean, three mana counter spells you, you will usually maybe be an exception, but for a while in standard, we saw the most generic removal spells cost four, and they often removed things that cost three, you know, three or four. So if you're constantly forcing them, the idea, the ideal, is that if you're constantly forcing your opponent to react, they're reacting at a mana deficiency, and so at some point you play two spells. They react to one, the other one sticks, and then it sort of gets a bunch of work done as you continue to force them to react to what you do after that. Right, I mean, a handful of cancels, it only takes a double spell turn before six. Yeah, exactly. You know, and you want to slide through these threats. Yeah, for sure, that makes sense. But anyway, the theme that without the teamer deck being able to, you know, play its game plan as intended, it kind of then limps along through the rest of the game is generally what you're aiming for. You just want to make your opponent have to do something other than what they would like to do if they were playing Solitaire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's exactly it. So... How you do that depends a lot in the different scenarios. I mean, um, the most obvious example is sometimes you can make your opponent chump block if you attack with a, with a creature that has lethal damage. Obviously, people don't want to chump block, but they do if it means they don't die. And so there are some simple ones like that. But another one that I think makes more sense in light of our recent episode on Wrathing, in which we said that you know control players should be as patient as possible with their Wrath because they're kind of backup plans. And they should try and stabilize in some other way so that the Wrath is there to always protect them. Oftentimes, when playing against Control and you know they have a Sweeper, it's correct to commit a bit more resources, another creature or two, to the board to put them in a position where they'll be taking too much damage if they don't Wrath. That way you get it out of their hand before you develop your more threatening cards. Um, like if you want to resolve, like for example, in standard, if you're trying to set it up where you want to run some creatures out so that you know your Nissa in hand will resolve, right? Like that's a good way you would think about doing it, right? Like this Planeswalker is a really sticky threat. It's really hard for them to answer. So like I'm going to run some stuff out, force them to like commit, and then I can stick this, right? Yeah, exactly. It means that they're wrathing your early drops, which are not your most threatening creatures. If you've measured your resources, they're only getting two or three cards for their sweeper, which they kind of need. It's their most powerful answer. And then, yeah, it also forces them to tap out, which can give you a window to resolve things. So by choosing when, like, because you're the proactive player, you get to dictate when your opponent has to react to what you do. And if you do that correctly, it, you know, gives you windows to do whatever else you want. Makes sense to me. Yeah, that's a really good example for managing those fights against control that I think are really important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else is there? I mean, there's a lot of ways, yeah, you can do it for um, sort of, would seem perhaps like uh, suboptimal plays in other ways, not just committing more creatures to the board, right? I mean, there's got to be other ways. Yeah, I mean, there's maybe another obvious one, which is um, it's generally sort of understood without thinking about it much that hand disruption allows you to more easily resolve your threats because obviously you get to just take their counterspell. But we never actually see hand disruption take a counterspell because they'll just, like, if you get thought erasured and you're holding a negate, you just negate the thought erasure. Everyone just counters the spell. <laughs> yeah. Because it hides information. And so what you're not doing is, I mean, in a way, yeah, you're getting the um, counter spell out of their hands so your other thing can resolve. But really, in this sort of framework, that thought erasure is forcing them to react with a negate before they'd like to. Right, it's so just, you should think about your sequencing in that way as sort of like, okay, well, if they have the worst possible here, what can I do to try and get it out of them? And can I afford to get it out of them here? Like, that's the first step. But yeah, I like this. This is a really good way of thinking about how to like maneuver through these things that they're going to do, right? How to, yeah. how to make it tantalizing, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Or even things like, um, uh, there was a game we played on Versus last night where Steli had a Tamiyo, and for a few turns he had been plussing it looking for Nyssa. Because Nissa was his best card there. It's a win con, generates a bunch of mana. He's just looking for a Nissa. And so that's his ideal use of that Tamiyo. And even though I didn't have much going on and whatever, I played a, uh, it was really my only option. So it doesn't, it wasn't really a big brain, big brain play for me, but it emphasizes this point 
I drew and played a Legion war boss, which made a 1-1, put some pressure on his planeswalkers. And then it's too risky for him to just plus looking for a Nyssa that could whiff, or plus Tamiyo looking for Nyssa, which could miss. And even if he does find it, it'll only make a 3-3, which I could potentially remove the next turn. And then my war boss would run away with the game. Right. So it forced him to minus to get back and eliminate to answer the war boss, which isn't what he wanted to be doing with that mana that turn or that activation on Tamiyo. So things like that, you can, even if it's your only option, if you consider them in the framework of how it's forcing my opponent to react, it can inform other decisions and just give you an understanding of how these turns play out. Yeah, it's a really good way of phrasing it. Yeah, because it's hard to pause and think like that in this game when there's a lot of so many sequencing issues that you also have to start thinking about what you know your opponent's doing. But this is something you have to do to start managing the early steps of, or sorry, the mid-game steps, right? Late game steps, what are they doing? How am I going to take this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another classic example of this uh, occurs in Limited. And this is the two-drop versus two-drop. Someone plays a two-drop, the other person plays a two-drop, and then the person attacks. I've had it so many times where Sometimes it even looks stupid. It's like a 2-2 two, two into a 2-2 two, two, or a 1-2 two into a 1-2. Like They just attack. And almost always it means they have a combat trick. People who... A lot of people who play limited really like just using combat tricks as soon as they can. And we've advised against this in the past. Like You can save your combat tricks for bigger boards where there'll be more of a blowout, where they'll eat bigger creatures, where, where you have you know more support for them, whatever. And our advice is always, like, if you're getting attacked on your opponent's turn three, just block. Because if they want to use a combat trick on their turn three, they're only trading it for your two drop, which is one of the worst cards in your deck. And it spends their turn. In M21 right. Limited, there's been so many times where, like, I'll play a two drop, my opponent will flash in masked black guard, and then they'll attack me. And I snap block every time, and then they put all three mana into it in our creature's trade, and my two drop just ate both their turns. Yeah, it's pretty good. Right. Yeah, it's quite good. And so, in this reactive framework, me choosing to block there forces them to react in some way. Like, if they... Because generally, I think what the player's mindset is, is that if I make this obviously bad attack, it looks like I have a combat trick, and so they won't block and I'll get free damage. But when I choose to block, I am now forcing them to react to the fact that their creature is going to die and use their mana or use their trick poorly right yeah of course okay that makes sense yeah this is something that i've been a long advocate of both of us have been yeah we we kind of rant about this all the time that we think it's for the better as far as just getting it out of the way um but there are times with open mana you can play this game as well in different ways but yeah i agree mm -hmm. wholeheartedly and so i think sort of an extension of this blocking to force them to use tricks generally you can kind of sense when your opponent has a trick in some way and most of the time, I'll just not block until I have open mana and I can fight the trick. But sometimes they're only attacking with one creature because their trick saves your one, their one creature from your biggest creature. And in those scenarios, I'll just block with everything. Yeah, just put the team. That's something people forget all the time. I even do it when I'm playing online that I yeah. forget to just put the team. So they are expecting that, you know, you'll block their 5-5 five five with your 6-6 six six and they'll give it plus 2-2 two plus two and they'll eat it. But if you block with your entire team, now they are forced to use their combat trick so that their creature doesn't, so that it wasn't a chump attack, so that it gets your 6-6. Six, six, and they still lose their creature. So like, over blocking often forces your opponent to waste combat tricks that they thought, like, that's kind of how you beat that mind game. Yeah, for sure. Now, as a warning here, because I think this example also illustrates this, a lot of these types of plays where you're trying to force your opponent to do something can go very, very horribly wrong if you just don't correctly think about all the options that your opponent has or if you misassess their resources or if you um, blank on some trick or some option that they have, which is what that attacking player did. Like, they're just assuming my opponent's options are block my 5-5 five, five with one of their creatures thinking they'll eat it and I'll win with this trick and they miss the option of putting the whole team in front. Right, yeah, the class. I've done because that a million times, Cam. I don't want to talk about it. This is a sore spot, man. You don't have to just call me out like this. Yeah, but because they're doing the same thing. They're trying to make you react. They're trying to make you react to the fact that they obviously have a counter, uh, a combat trick by not blocking. 
that's how they think they're making you react. But if they miss a potential one of your reactions, they just get blown out. So yeah. you should be careful that that doesn't happen to you. Oh, yeah, it does. But we try not to. We try not to. Another but, episode we do where you have a really good idea and I'm, I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, I should apply this to my own playing. Yeah. So like the one where you could um, commit more to the board to try and make them wrath. If they just decide that you didn't commit enough and they like play a planeswalker or play a blocker or draw some cards, suddenly you have to commit even more and now you just lose a bunch to the wrath. Whereas if you had con committed creature B instead of creature A and that would be enough, then they only get those. Like you got to make sure that you measure this all correctly. And it's hard. It just takes a bunch of practice, but it's kind of a framework to think about games. For sure. I think it's really good. An even fancier example of the combat one. And I think this one is more likely to come up than just these obvious like chump attacks. But often in limited, one person will have a removal spell and one person will have, say, a pump spell. Like I have do four damage and you have plus three plus three. And whoever acts first there loses that exchange. If I try and do four damage to your creature and you pump it, I waste my removal spell. If you try and pump your creature and I respond by killing it, you waste both your cards. So then the whole game, if both players assume that the other player has the spell, kind of becomes about how can I attack that doesn't give them blocks, that forces me to have to use this pump spell to which they can respond? And on the other side, like, how can I attack that makes them have to use this pump spell so that I can respond with my... And it becomes, like, the whole sort of combat stage of the game becomes about each player trying to force the other person to react first by using their spell and therefore getting blown out. So I don't really have any advice in that scenario. It's going to depend on a lot of things, but just viewing those situations not under like not as just combat but as like how can i use combat to try and make my opponent cast spells in a certain way i think would really like level up people's limited combat abilities yeah i agree that makes right. sense there's, this is, there's this is combat abilities in limited not that yeah. everyone <laughs> i get what you mean this is something we've talked about a bunch between the three of us and done episodes here and there but i do think it's one of the fundamental ways to improve a limited is thinking about it in ways like this mm -hmm. Anything else we want to add? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I hope this episode makes you react by liking, sharing, <laughs> <laughs> showing it to your friends, anything to help the podcast grow. Yeah, if you I'll want to react by supporting us, you can check us out on Patreon. Uh, the link is on dwc.gg, which is our new live website. All nice right. one. Shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> on that note uh, thank you all for joining the club this week make sure as always wizardtower.com for all your magic single needs like Cam alluded to you can find all of our pages and our content on dwc.gg also if you want to support us there's links to the Patreon there and however you listen to the show whether it's Podbean, iTunes, any podcast app leave a review, rate the podcast, share it with your friends everything helps bring this thing to new listeners and keep it growing and just a reminder, we there will be no DWC versus next week as the three of us are going away to a cottage and we'll be drinking plenty of Coronas. So we'll be taking a week off, but we'll be back the week after. Thank you for oh, listening. Yeah. We'll catch you next week. See ya. See ya.